Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our program today on this beautiful, hot August day. Um, I am Dina Mallory. I'm the Director of Public Programs at Bennington Museum, and I'm delighted to be able to bring us all together uh, virtually today. Thank goodness for technology. <laughs> um, as many of you know, the 250th anniversary, sorry, as many of you know, um, the 243rd anniversary of the Battle of Bennington is coming up next weekend. And um, here in Vermont, Bennington Battle Day is a holiday, something that we all look forward to. Uh, but it came as no surprise uh, this year when the typical festivities had to be canceled. What maybe came as a bit more of a surprise was how quickly groups of people started mobilizing to make sure that the year would not go by without the anniversary being honored. Uh, it's a, a battle that has been honored and remembered every year since it happened in 1777. So we certainly don't want to miss anything this year. And we have a wide range of events planned. Um, the, the group that has been working to commemorate the battle this year. Uh, and after this presentation, I'll, I'll send everybody a list by email uh, or a copy of the press release by email um, so that you are aware of all of the events that are going on. Um, but one of the most exciting things that I think will be going on is this. Hopefully you can see that on your screen, the reverse parade scheduled for uh, Battle Day, August 16th. And um, they are asking people to register to be a part of it. You can see all of that information here. Um, the deadline for reservations is tomorrow, but I think they're a little flexible with that. So as long as you register, I think they'll let you be a part of it. So lots of fun things going on. I, I have to just give a shout out to um, Jonas Spivak and Phil Holland, who really spearheaded the effort to uh, make sure that this year did not go uncelebrated. Uh, now I would like to welcome David Pitlick. David, I'm going to start your video. I'm going to ask you to start your video. There he is. You can see the top of your head. <laughs> And uh, David is the historic site assistant at the Battle of Benning, or sorry, at the Bennington Battlefield, uh, right across the border from Vermont in, um, I guess, technically Hoosick, right, Vermont, uh, New York. And um, David's been there since 2015, and in that time, uh, he's really worked to uh, make a lot of improvements to the visitor experience at the battlefield, and conducting archaeological research there. And, um, and actually, and maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about this, um, some of his research actually led to uh, the acquisition of a, a pretty significant piece of property, um, significant both in size and in relevance to the Battle of Bennington by the Battlefield Land Trust. Um, so that's a really uh, a good feather in your cap, <laughs> David, really excellent work. Um, I do want to apologize in advance. Um, if anyone's been to the battlefield, you know that it's in a pretty rural area and they're up there in the hills. And uh, surprisingly, the internet is not top notch <laughs> right up there. So um, if things get a little laggy, just bear with us. Um, hopefully we won't run into any technical glitches. Um, all right, so. Today, David is going to share with us some of the information uh, about the Battle of Bennington that will make you, uh, make all of us, some of the most knowledgeable people at our virtual Battle Day parties. Um, and at the end, um, I'm really excited to be able to share with you um, something that David and I and Mary Lou Chicote at the Bat uh, Bennington Battle Monument have been working on. Um, which is a virtual driving right. tour um, of the Battle of Bennington, of some of the sites um, relevant to the Battle of Bennington. And I'll be sharing that link with you at the end of our program today. So without further to do, ado, I'm going to stop talking and uh, turn it over to David. Just before I do, I'd like to remind everyone to please keep yourself muted and keep your video off. And for the best viewing, you will want to set it to speaker view. 
and make sure you're in full screen mode. All right, David, I am turning it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as you said, our internet connection out here can be uh, hit or miss. Um, so hopefully we won't have too much distortion or stuttering in the video if that's the case. Um, hopefully someone can just let me know in the, uh, the chat window. So I have been the uh, historic site assistant at Bennington Battlefield uh, since 2015. I've been on site. <laughs> it was really a, 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 an interesting sort of, sort of a, a first month on the 2015 culture. Uh, I've been sort of uniquely positioned to. Uh, to benefit from some of the recent uh, research that was uh, that was done as a result of the uh, survey. So while I will uh, I will uh, take credit for uh, spearheading the most recent acquisition, um, I I suppose I probably shouldn't take credit for uh, the initial conclusions uh, that led us to uh, to. Uh, the importance of the, the property in question. So uh, I am going to uh, go ahead and change my screen here. I'm going to share, hopefully. The PowerPoint. Okay. I believe that will because I no longer have access to the chat panel. So let's begin. So the Battle of Bennington obviously takes place uh, in 1777, given that this is the 243rd anniversary. Uh, it's a part of the Saratoga campaign. The Saratoga campaign was an attempt on the part of the crown to follow up on the success that uh, they had met with the previous year in repelling the American invasion of Canada. Uh, it's going to be commanded by uh, General Burgoyne. He, this is sort of his brainchild, not really. Um, he sort of adapts some of the uh, concepts that were uh, already in consideration for the campaign. But uh, basically what we're dealing with here, at least in theory, uh, was a three-pronged attack uh, through the uh, Mohawk and Hudson River Valleys. So Burgoyne himself would lead an army of about uh, 8,000 south out of Canada, driving on Albany. Uh, another force would proceed under St. Leger through the Mohawk River Valley, essentially as a diversion, uh, in the hopes that it would draw away um, some of the uh, Patriot forces. And then, at least in theory, uh, General Howe was supposed to have advanced uh, from New York City uh, in support of this uh, operation, that will end up not being the case. So as you can see by our timeline here, I've sort of, I, I sort of have things color-coded. Um, so obviously the red is the uh, sort of the initial success that we're going met with while on campaign. And, you know, his successes were considerable through July. And then, of course, the turning point before the turning point, the turning point um, in the Battle of Bennington um, takes place, after which, you know, Burgoyne is not going to really see much in the way of uh, success again. He could claim the Battle of Freeman's Farm uh, as a British victory, but really it doesn't, uh, even if they do end up holding the field, it doesn't really position them to do much of anything. So 
The Battle of Bennington is essentially the turning point of the campaign, but the die was cast as far as, um, you know, the cooperation uh, Burgoyne could expect to receive from the South as early as April. When uh, Howe, who is commander in chief of British forces in uh, North America, decides he's going to take an opportunity and uh, try and knock out the rebel uh, capital. So if he captures Philadelphia, the seat of Congress, he figures that's you know a rather bold stroke. He's the Washington and anyone else. So as soon as that decision is made. It really uh, sort of is going to put General Burgoyne on the back foot. So we talked a little bit about his plan. Uh, This quotation here is taken from his uh, paper, essentially, Thoughts for Conducting the War from the Side of Canada. And he writes... These ideas are formed upon the supposition that it will be the purpose of the Canada Army to effect a junction with General Howe, or after cooperating so far as to get possession of Albany, and open the communications to New York, to remain upon the Hudson's River, and thereby enable the General to act with his whole force to the southward. So, in my mind, the key phrase there is cooperating so far as to get possession of Albany, (laughs) right? That cooperation is already out the window. Now, let's do a a little, uh, you know, setting up the stage. Uh, This is a map that uh, may be inflammatory to some of our our viewers today. Uh, This is an engraving or a... uh, a map created in 1777 uh, showing a very different New York than uh, what we're all familiar with today. Um, You can see that in place of Vermont, um, we've got some uh, uh, New York uh, County, which is basically just to say that essentially the battle, you are dealing with the two pop and it was the independent public of Vermont, um, which caused them to just to sort of uh, present the controversy in a nutshell, there are essentially between New York and the New Hampshire governments. Uh, most of the not most actually set um, or to build on uh, the one when New York straight with a Series of different trucks of different owners off of the property in an attempt to fight. Um, there's a bit of a uh, difference of opinion between those who are settled in Vermont and those, for the most part, but not entirely, uh, land speculators in New York who would basically seek to either dispossess them or get them on a New York title and have them start paying rents. So we've got this controversy. It's not going to be resolved until uh, New York is granted uh, statehood, pardon me, Vermont is granted statehood in 1791. Now you'll notice I titled the previous two slides uh, with a sort of a well-known quote, the gods of the valley are not the gods of the hills. I suppose I would be remiss if I didn't include some uh, recent scholarship. There is a push um, by at least a couple of authors to sort of uh, shift the story of the founding of Vermont. And uh, it's particularly...
particularly as it relates. And the case that New York was in the right. So, uh, Yeah, that the breath uh, investigation, if you're interested. So that basically, Ted. Test if he can control the major waterways of New York City. This plan is strong, but Burgoyne didn't even abide by sort of the provisions aligned while planning this whole campaign. He's actually setting off with fewer Indian volunteers than he originally expects. So at as he's marching to the south, he encounters a logistical problem. His problem is not so much how do I bring the fight to the enemy, but how do I move my army, especially you know through the uh, quote unquote American wilderness. You know he does avail himself of waterways and fairly substantial roadways that have been recently constructed or relatively recently constructed. But you know the Patriots are. Uh, blocking his path, harassing him as he advances. Uh, so this, the task of keeping his army supplied turns out to be an all-consuming one uh, from his perspective. So how is he going to finally make that push to capture Albany? Well, he's going to need some assistance. He's going to need to bring in some additional supplies. One of the ideas that was floated and this is going back um, essentially about two to three weeks prior in the month of July, uh, was formulated by the commander of the German wing of his army. General Redazel suggests a long sort of circuitous uh, raid through Vermont. He figures that it's lightly defended at this time and that a detachment would have really no no difficulty in forwarding uh, supplies to the main army on this sort of long uh, maneuver through Vermont. Now, that's July. <laughs> We're now in August. Uh, the situation is uh, con considerably different. Um, basically, every moment, every day that we're going delays making this final push is granting the, the uh, Patriot Army time to respond. It might have been on the back foot in July, and it might have been more just, uh, that is really no longer the case. And Redazel makes that clear. He's rather stunned that Burgoyne puts his original plan with modifications into action at this late date. So what exactly is that plan? What are the what is this detachment task with doing? Uh, well, really, there's a, one sentence in uh, the orders to the man who will command this detachment, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich Baum, that sums it up. Quote: The object of your expedition to the councils of the enemy to mount Redazel's dragoons, to complete Peter's Corps, and obtain large supplies of cattle, horses, and carriages. Now, we'll touch on, um, you know, most of these, uh, most of these subjects as we proceed through the presentation. But one thing, one turn of phrase that may uh, be a little confusing to a general audience, um, be the second, to try the affections of the country. Well, what could that possibly mean? What does it mean to try someone's um, affections? Uh, essentially, he's tasked with recruiting loyalists. 
the, the phrase following that, to disconcert the counsels of the enemy. Gosh, what a phrase. Uh, <laughs> in plain English, uh, Baum is being told that he needs to give out that he is the vanguard to Burgoyne's army, not a detachment um, marching on his left, and that he is the spearhead to an invasion into New England. Uh, it's essentially a little bit of disinformation. So, Baum is uh, dispatched um, on August 11th. Uh, he's going to begin his march toward Bennington. And essentially, you know, Philip Skeen, who we'll, we'll touch on here and there throughout the presentation, has convinced we're going to this point that on the march, Baum will meet with, uh, you know, considerable support um, from the countryside, from the general population. That It's going to prove to be, you know, um, Baum is given a uh, detachment of 760 at the outset as he is marching. He will go uh, down the exact numbers, let's say 350 to 400 is floated as, you know, as likely a figure, really being set up to fail. Um, he's tasked with making a, a trip over 2,000 miles in the round um, over the course of two weeks. He is not only supposed to be repelling, you know, harassing attacks, he's supposed to be uh, gathering supplies, uh, paying people in hard coin, or essentially writing IOUs, you know, Extend, extending uh, the protection of Burgoyne's army to the countryside, essentially sort of serving as sort of a uh, roving guarantor of the king, the return of the king's government, and sort of swearing out loyalty oaths. And it's really just a mess. It's not something that, <laughs> it's not a very clear-cut mission, especially for a man like Baum, who, as far as we know, uh, is relatively uh, well regarded up to this point, but perhaps uh, not as well experienced as some others that might have been tapped for the command here. So we've got the Crown forces in motion. Let's change our perspective. Let's take a look at the Patriot side of the equation. Very early on, uh, the sort of de facto government and the grants, eventually Vermont by this time, um, are going to see their position fairly cl fairly clearly. They simply do not have the men required to defend their territory from an incursion. Uh, to that effect, Ira Allen is going to make a an appeal to the state of New Hampshire. Vermont, you'll be frontier. You, you will be uh, next. Uh, so who's the thank for that? Well, who funds the uh, the uh, the detachment here? Rather, the uh, the force that will be commanded by uh, General Stark. His his logic is fairly simple. He assumes that should the revolution succeed by pr providing this financial support to the forces to the militia of New Hampshire that he is going to be, you know, he's going to personally gain from the success of that. And of course, should the revolution fail, well, he would expect to be hanged as a traitor <laughs> or at least, you know, face uh, significant repercussions. So he has every reason to uh, support this force and to support it uh, generously. So there's the, there's the funding story, um, at least, 
partially. What about the leadership? Well, as I mentioned, uh, General Stark is going to be tasked with commanding uh, the Patriot forces that will end up coming to the assistance of the uh, of Vermont. And you really could not have selected a more capable commander. Um, he is an experienced ranger. Uh, going back to the last war, the French and Indian War, um, he has already seen some action early on in the revolution. And just to give just to give a little bit of flavor here as to you know what kind of a man he was, um, we've got a possibly apocryphal quote that is attributed to Stark around the uh, prelude uh, to the Battle of Trenton. Quote, and this is directed at uh, General Washington, keep in mind. Your men have too long been accustomed to place their dependence for safety upon spades and pickaxes. If you hope to establish the independence of these states, you must teach them to place dependence upon their firearms and courage. So at this point, you know, Stark is essentially scolding Washington for being uh, too defensive, uh, for not uh, taking enough risks. Which, if you're aware of the <laughs> of the background to uh, the Battle of Trenton, um, is a rather remarkable uh, sentiment. Now, Stark is very uh, spirited. He's very capable, but there is one problem to this particular selection for command. Um, he is essentially on the the outside, you know, looking in as far as uh, congressional politics goes at this time. Um, he's had a few different people promoted ahead of him that he considered, you know, his subordinates. He writes uh, Congress for redress of this particular grievance. He's rebuffed, so he resigns his commission. He, you know, he a lot of men might bluff and say, you know, if I am not afforded the treatment to which I believe I'm, you know, entitled, I might resign my commission as, you know, sort of a scare tactic. Um, Stark follows through. He simply returns to New Hampshire. When he receives uh, the commission to lead the New Hampshire state militia on this in this particular alarm, um, it's only at the, you know, under the authority of the state of New Hampshire. He has no uh, command as far, as far as the continental line goes. And he's very, this is exactly what he wanted. Um, and so when he is asked, you know, as he brings up this substantial force, when he's asked to join the main army, um, by General Lincoln, he just rebuffs Lincoln entirely. Um, and Lincoln sort of flummoxed. And he reports back um, to General Schuyler uh, the instructions which General Stark says he had has received from them in New Hampshire. Well, as it started in two fifty uh, in Vermont is in <laughs> with this uh, direction remain in this area and harass Burgoyne's left flank, which is would have been his intention. Now he's going to be perfectly positioned to check this detachment that is marching as luck would have it on Bennington around this time. So the two forces uh, make contact August 14th. Um, there's a skirmish, not on the uh, 
current state historic site, but some distance to the west um, at a uh, mill. Some shots are fired. The Patriot forces under Colonel Gregg, he's got 200 men serving as a screen to Stark's army. They withdraw in good order. They break down a bridge and they report to Stark what they've uh, seen. That there is a uh, sizable detachment marching toward Bennington. Uh, Baum, for his, uh, you know, uh, for his uh, part, he ca he captures some American prisoners who give him precise uh, and accurate numbers for uh, Stark's force, at least at this time, which is kind of interesting. You know, they don't even try to inflate the numbers. <laughs> they just give him the accurate intelligence when asked. Um, so Baum is marching into this with his eyes open. He knows more or less, you know, what to expect here. Now, when we talk about numbers, obviously, you know, we're, we're talking about sort of upper and lower ranges. Um, for Stark's command, the upper range, this would be probably higher than, you know, you read in most accounts, uh, 2,500. The standard figure, and even 2,000 or so, is usually what's given. And the difficulty there in establishing a precise figure is simply that, you know, yes, Stark's got his different militia forces out of, out of uh, New Hampshire, but you've also got two other states contributing, namely uh, Massachusetts and, of course, Vermont. Conspicuously absent, you'll note, are in uh, uh, New York militia. Um, as far as we know, and you know, I'm a New Yorker, <laughs> full disclosure, but, um, you know, as far as we know, uh, the only New Yorkers at the Battle of Bennington were the Tories. There were, uh, there was one force, uh, that was responding that was on the march on their way. They do not arrive in time to participate in the battle. So... As far as we know, no New Yorkers. What does Baum have? Well, as far as professional forces, he's got about 460 as he sets out, plus some auxiliaries. And this is another challenge to uh, Baum's command. He's got a multinational, multilingual force that he has to command. He's got American loyalists, He's got Francophone Canadians. He's got native warriors, most but not all, speaking a Mohawk dialect. Um, so he's really, you know, got a force that is often described as a mixed bag. So where is the battle actually going to be fought? Well, Baum fortifies after sort of refusing to take Stark's bait. Stark does attempt um, to pre present his forces on the open field in order of battle to invite Baum to just sort of slug it out in a line battle. Um, Baum is not interested in doing that. <laughs> Um, his orders are clear that if he is met with any significant opposition, he's supposed to sit tight and consult with the General Burgoyne as to what to do next. Burgoyne is the only uh, person set up to make that decision um, as to whether to reinforce and commit to a fight or to pull back, retreat. Baum interprets you know, even marching back just a couple miles to more advantageous ground as a retreat. Well, I'm here now, so here I am. here I must stay until my uh, reinforcements arrive. He takes up a series of posts here, which some of which are were incredibly ill-advised, um, over about. 0.8 miles uh, east to west. Now, an uh, important thing to note here is that this is the Durnford map of the battle. 
and that it is not oriented with north to the top. So in order to actually get a, get a handle on uh, you know, your orientations, you need to just sort of flip this 90 degrees counterclockwise. North is going to be at the right-hand side of the map. But as you can see, um, Baum takes up a series of positions centered on a bridge head, and then to his right and left of way, he will harass Baum's positions um, in the prelude to the battle. And this is going to be essentially a multi-day um, affair. You've got skirmishing um, on the 14th. You've even got skirmishing on August 15th, which is a day of rain. And even though we generally say the battle begins around 3 o'clock in the afternoon on August 16th, if you read the accounts, it's very clear that there was skirmishing all day in the buildup to that you know, main attack. So we're gonna take things just piece by piece. Uh, we're going to start on Hessian Hill. Um, and that is the area of the battlefield you'd be most familiar with if you've ever visited. That is the area where you have battlefield lane to get you up and then a, a comfort station and uh, some interpretive panels. So this is what most people think of when they think of the battlefield. But really, as we'll see, it's, it, the battlefield stretches uh, many miles. Uh, this is a position that was defended by the Dragoons with Bomb's Force. Uh, dragoons were trained on horseback, but in this instance, they were leased to the king, dismounted. They're basically fighting on foot. They are fortifying a rather lengthy breastworks structure, an open structure on the hilltop here. And they are going to be attacked by a vastly superior force of patriots. So Stark dispatches uh, Colonel Nichols um, with 250 uh, New Hampshire militia. Uh, Colonel Herrick the, the, with uh, the Vermont Rangers, he's got about 300. Um, this is a significant force. Baum does not have, as far as dragoons go, um, about, you know, more than 220 or so. And there's some debate as to, as to how a raid here. So really, it's troops for the crown. Interestingly, the Americans on their approach to the, make this attack actually request reinforcements. So as best you know, we can tell, what that suggests is there were other smaller positions um, in addition to the uh, Dragoon breastworks on the hilltop here that they must have been clearing or hoping to clear as they went. So you know, there's the baggage position, there's some little fletches not shown on the Durnford map. There do appear on German maps of the battle on the hillside, you know, perhaps some of these uh, Patriot forces were cleaning those up. Now, this position here, just from a bird's eye view, looks like a no-brainer. This is a high ground on your flank. Why would you not take it if you want to secure a position here? Well, it really comes down to the specifics of the terrain itself. You can see this is the annotated um, version of the Durnford map reproduced from Phil Lord's book, uh, War Over Walloomskoik. And he estimates that for about 200 feet uh, in front of the Dragoon Breastworks, you had an open field of fire. And then beyond that, you actually had a pretty solid tree line. So obviously, you know, what, what, what's the stereotypical way when we think of uh, you know, American militia fight from behind cover, right? <laughs> and this is going to essentially be, you know, just that. You know, the Americans are going to take advantage of the cover and concealment that this terrain affords to essentially negate the defender's advantage. So 
So, uh, I witnessed to tell the story. Uh, this appears in the journal of virgins made to uh, the dragoons here. Uh, quote. A violent volley of fire erupted against the entrenchment. Erupts to a smaller post. The enemy in cold blood and with much courage behind us for but as they fell backwards and no longer moved a finger. Thus, in a short time, our tallest and best dragons were sent into eternity. The German cannon shot balls and grape shot sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left, and then again forward into the brush. From the enemy side, the fire became increasingly lively, and they, meaning the Americans, pressed harder. The cannon in our entrenchment was quiet now because the sergeant artificer who commanded it had been shot. The eight men at the cannon were all either shot or wounded. At the bridge where our Lieutenant Colonel Baum was standing, the cannon and volley fire had ceased. Captain Dom was covering our left flank and rarely encircled. So, Here we have a couple watercolors uh, depicting some of the uh, figures in the account that I just read. On the right hand side, we have a uh, dragoon. On the left, we have a depiction prepared actually uh, based on uh, the Wasmus account of an American militia. And you can see that the, the militia are advantaged, especially fighting in a hot day as August 16th indeed was. They're simply fighting in their shirt sleeves, lightly equipped, whereas dragoons are obviously um, in their regimental coats. They're heavily equipped. Let's move down the hill to the bridge position. Uh, the bridge here was known as Wilcox's Bridge on the opposite bank of the Wilcox River. That will analytical techniques be termed key terrain. This is a bridge position. You want to control the bridge, which gives access to the road to Bennington. It is not a nice place to be if you are a civilian. Uh, Burgoyne has made it clear that he is sort of uh, going to use some of his native forces as a weapon of terror. So you will either comply with my directives as a civilian or face my wrath is sort of the, uh, the long short of that. Well, the family that happened to live on the farmstead where uh, Bong digs in makes it this camp. Uh, it's the Beardsley family. Uh, they don't want anything think the grandfather in a family account is essentially you know, arms for either side according to family tradition when a a uh, German soldier attempted to fortify his cabin. He actually barred the door against the, the soldier, which is fascinating, given we have an account from Wasmus that talks about how after, you know, some of these uh, native warriors in Baum's vanguard introduced themselves <laughs> uh, to uh, some of the sons in the Beardsley family who were out in the field at the time, um, they're ready to flee. But they're told, no, 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 you, you need to remain in place. Don't flee. So not a very uh, um, nice place to be. This is actually, it's a rather understudied portion of the battlefield, this bridge position or river flats position, if you like. But it is extremely important to the first engagement insofar as it is the location where uh, Patriot forces secure victory. 
This is where Baum attempts a series of desperate um, charges at sword point, having exhausted his ammunition to cut a path um, through the Patriot militia in the hopes of uh, hooking up with his uh, reinforcements, which were about an hour or two late to the battle, which is rather stunning. Uh, we have it from a German map prepared by one of the, the commander of the artillery in the first engagement, uh, Lieutenant Bach. We have it from uh, his map, you know, that these fields uh, and behind the uh, Beardsley cabin, behind the modern uh, Barnett house, are where the uh, whole corps was taken prisoner. And just to tie things in to our in to our introduction earlier today, you know this is an excellent example of. So with our uh, 2015 survey, we conducted archaeological investigations of those uh, current within the bounds of the modern state historically. Um, based on those archaeological investigations and based on our research and really just sort of collected uh, as much as there was to collect, that about 23 acres to the west of a uh, current uh, property should be included within uh, the state historic site as a part of those surrender fields. So if you uh, saw other recent articles in the news about that acquisition, um, which has not yet been transferred to New York State Parks. It's currently held by the American Battlefield Trust, who are our partner in this. Um, you know, that's the reasoning. That's why this went forward. Now let's cross the river and conclude our discussion with the first engagement um, by talking about the Tory Fort. The Tory Fort as a problem very similar to the Dragoon Breastworks in that, yes, it is on the high ground, but the attackers have plenty of uh, concealment, if not cover, for, through which to make their approach, to make their attack here. Um, notably, there's a ravine at the southwestern corner of the redoubt that allows a, a detachment of American uh, Patriot militia accidentally, it's worth you noting to flank <laughs> in this position. And of course, the man. People march, you know, much more closely than they ought to have been. But thanks to the cover of, of from the crest of the hill, which would have given the defenders, you know, a bit, just an absolutely terrible position, and it's going to fall pretty quickly. Uh, Twenty four is overrun. Count of uh, John Peters, who had command of the Queen's Loyal Rangers. And it's worth noting, it's, there is a outside chance that his loyalists may have been posted at the baggage. Um, but I think the account really just gives you an excellent idea of what it was like um, to fight as a loyalist in this battle. Quote, August 16th, 1777, I commanded the loyalists at Bennington, where I had 291 men of my regiment with me. And I lost above half of them in that engagement. The action commenced about nine o'clock in the morning and continued till near four o'clock in the afternoon when we retired in much confusion. A little before the Royalists gave way, the rebels pushed with a strong party on the front of the Loyalists where I commanded. As they were coming up, I observed a man fire at me, which I returned. He loaded again as he came up and discharged again at me, crying out, Peters, you damn Tory, I've got you. He rushed on me with his bayonet, which entered just below my breast. 
but was turned by the bone. By this time I was loaded. I saw that it was a rebel captain, an old schoolfellow and playmate, a cousin of my wife's. Though his bayonet was in my body, I felt regret at being obliged to destroy him. So what a difference um, that makes knowing uh, the enemy personally. Now we come to the second engagement. The first engagement was essentially a, uh, a fight uh, for forces that were uh, posts. It's not or so. It runs until sunset and is fought in two, sort of a running fight, the better part of two miles, uh, east and west, more or less on the path of uh, modern uh, Route 67. Um, this is going to be fought for the crown, basically by the column under the command of uh, Brayman. Brayman's got 642 fresh troops that arrive just basically in time to hear that something's going on to the west, or pardon me, to the east. Uh, Brayman is going to claim that he had no idea the battle was over when he arrives here. He never heard a shot fired. The strength of that claim, I guess, is going to depend on you know how conspiratorial you are. <laughs> There's some people who say that he, this was an intentional um, action on his part, that he there was some sort of peak between Bremen and Baum. Whether that's the case or not, I, I tend to discount that. Um, he is too late to come to Baum's aid. Uh, for the Americans, we also have some uh, additional forces to consider. Uh, notably, we've got, since they're about 140, we can go ahead and round that up to 150. Um, Seth Warner was present in the first engagement of the battle, but he didn't have any men you know, directly under his command. In the second engagement, his Green Mountain Boys arrived, 150 troops, and they are going to be instrumental in turning the tide of the second engagement. So uh, how close was the second engagement? Well, we mentioned Philip Skeen a little earlier on in the presentation. He's here essentially as Baum's uh, civilian advisor. And he writes a very fascinating account of the, the whole thing, noting that you know victory was at our command, his words. Basically, had the troops marched a little more quickly and had they not just wasted their ammunition constantly firing at an ineffective range. So rather than, um, you know, continuing any further myself, I'm going to allow a eyewitness once again to uh, pick up the story. Uh, this time this comes from the account of David Holbrook. So this is the second engagement, quote. The Americans then ran together and formed southwesterly from the entrenchments, which had been occupied by General Baum, and faced the reinforcement, which was under the command of Keensboro. But the Americans, in pursuing those who escaped from the entrenchments, had gotten scattered and fatigued, and but few assembled at first, but kept falling in continually until a line was formed along the fence on the northeast side of the meadow, in which was the haystack aforesaid. You'll notice some of the language here is a little strange. He's, uh, this is part of a deposition, so there's some legal, legalistic terms of phrase. Um, in the edge of a piece of woods, and the British army formed the line in the meadow and extending across the road, and the firing commenced as soon as they came with a musket shot. But the American Americans not being sufficiently strong enough to keep the ground from tree to tree, firing as they left the trees until they came to a ravine where there was a log fence and there made a halt and held the ground. The British came up within about 16 rods and stood there firing, which continued some time without cessation until Colonel Warner, with the remains of his regiment, came up 
And some of his men, understanding the artillery exercise, took over one of the field pieces taken in the first engagement and formed on the right of the party, in which was this declarer. And about the same time, an old man with an old Queen Anne's iron sword and mounted upon an old black mare with about 90 robust men following behind him two files deep came up and filed in front of the company commanded by Captain Parker, in which this declarant then was. And just as the old man, man had gotten his men to the spot and halted, his mare fell, and he jumped upon a large white oak stump and gave the command. Captain Parker, seeing the old man's company between him and the enemy, ordered his men to file in between their files, which were some distance apart, and which was immediately done. And the battle then became desperate. And immediately, this declarant heard a tremendous crash up in the woods at the right wing of the American troops, which was seconded by a yell, the most terrible that he ever heard. He then heard the voice of Colonel Warner like thunder, fix bayonet, charge. Then the old man on the stump cried out, charge boys, and jumped from the stump and ran toward the enemy. His men, some with and some without bayonets, followed suit and rushed upon the enemy with all their might, who, seeing us coming, took to their heels and were completely routed. Holy cow, what, what an image. So you have the king's troops being uh, fired upon by their own cannon. You know, professional troops under Seth Warner's command breaking the crown forces on a bayonet charge. That's not something American militia is supposed to be able to do, but here they are doing it. And so that's really sort of, uh, you know, it encapsulates the whole spirit of the battle. And the aftermath of the battle. Here we here uh, we see the painting of uh, a Colonel Baum and Fister, a uh, local loyalist and a prominent uh, prominent local loyalist and commander of a loyalist in the battle, who were both mortally wounded, um, being carried behind uh, a fair distance to the east to a. Uh, small cabin where they both, they both end up expiring. And then this this uh, chart really sort of uh, tells the whole story. You wouldn't really need to hear any of the uh, the rest of the narrative if you just saw this chart to you know how things went for the crown. <laughs> so uh, Stark, in a uh, early report, um, mentions that, as I read it, just as New Hampshire regiments suffered 30 killed and 40 wounded, those numbers are probably a little higher when all's you know, said and done. Baum's force, for its part, loses killed at least 207, 80 wounded, about 700 prisoners. Um, so you have, this is really a very one-sided victory. And if the battle had uh, been fought earlier in the day, you know, it's possible that Stark would have actually captured all of Brayman's force as well, making the victory even more one-sided, if you can believe that. So, uh, in addition to the uh, casualties, we've got uh, four cannons seized. These are the only cannons. that Burgoyne will lose until he surrenders after the battles of Saratoga. The one of the major outcomes in lives is sort of the intangible uh, effect it had on morale. This is a victory when you know victory was you know most needed. Now, I am uh, aware that we are at uh, 3 o'clock here. We're already uh, sort of an hour in. But I would like to spend at least a moment talking about how the battle has been commemorated and what we've done to uh, study it in recent years. So, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, the Battle of Bennington is perhaps the uh, 
earliest and most, you know, uh, frequently an unbroken chain uh, commemorated battle of the revolution. In 1778, there were events in the town of Bennington marking the occasion on the anniversary, which is remarkable. And of course, as time goes on, things only sort of snowball to the point where yeah, for the centennial of the battle, we got a triumphal, a temporary triumphal arch erected in downtown Bennington. Um, we've got a uh, visit from uh, Rutherford D. Hayes and in attendance, at least 40,000 people. Holy cow. Um, Vermont is going to continue to lead the way in commemorating the battle. For obvious reasons, it's Vermonters who fight it. Um, in part, so to the point where we actually. We actually had created in it's kid in eighteen ninety, and what do you imagine? They lose, but there is sort of a recognition that, given the geographical location of the battlefield within the modern bounds of the state, uh, something ought to be done. So in eighteen ninety two, we have sort of this humorous. Well, it was written in all seriousness, but in our view, in our view, humorous. Um, opinion piece being uh, published that essentially this shouldn't this battle shouldn't even be called the Battle of Bennington that Bennington had nothing to do with it <laughs> and so on so obviously you know as I said Vermont leads the way uh, there were you know obviously there were events that were on the occasion in New York. Um, but none of them had sort of the, uh, the same cachet. New York eventually does have a private park on the River Flats in the shadow of a uh, power generating station for the trolley line to, for people to gather and say, yes, I visited Bennington Battlefield. Um, the trolley park is uh, rather short lived, however. It's not going to be until 1927 that we get the creation of the modern uh, historic site. Obviously, not under New York State Parks. Um, we're going to bounce around um, between different organizations before it would become a New York State Park. Um, but we are created as a public site or dedicated, I guess, to the in 1927, um, thanks to the efforts of uh, finally going to be commemorated um, too much fanfare in, within the bounds of New York State. But this was really an uphill battle. <laughs> um, it's really fascinating. A uh, New York State governor actually vetoed initial legislation to create the site just because he thought it was fiscally irresponsible to do so. We have uh, fights erupting, or well, you know, arguments erupting between different assemblymen. We have uh, a man in Hoosick, an assemblyman in Hoosick, who was opposed by an assemblyman in Troy on the ground of, to even mark the battle, the battlefield, on the grounds that everyone knows that it took place in, in Bennington, Vermont, right? Wild to think. Now in the you know the modern era, we have markers on Hessian Hill commemorating the uh, sacrifices that were made of New Hampshire troops, Vermont troops, as well as uh, the Berkshire militia. Um, in 1931, uh, Massachusetts finally gets its uh, its due in the whole uh, commemoration. Processed. 
So what do things look like in the present day? Well, this is worth sharing. Um, as you can see, you know, Mary Lou, uh, Chakotay, and I, we have our, our uh, job cut out for ourselves here in explaining the relationship of the battle monument to the, uh, to the battlefield. It can very frequently uh, confuse some, uh, you know, out-of-state, out-of-town uh, visitors. And most recently... You know, I hinted earlier that there was a 2015 cultural resource survey. Um, there were multiple components to that um, that included metal detection, ground penetrating radar, uh, LIDAR, luminol testing for the presence of blood on projectiles, uh, and satellite imagery. All these modern tools not in existence, obviously, at the site's creation. And, you know, we ended up as you would expect, learning a few things. And also, you know, equally as important, confirming some things that were already known. Um, I should mention, I've already mentioned, that really the magisterial study on the battle was prepared um, not in 2015, you know, with, with all thanks to our consultants, um, but earlier, I believe, published in 89 by Phil Lorberg, uh, War Over Loom Scholic, and really when we when the, our consult, consultants were designing this study, they sort of used that. That is a, is a springboard with good reason. So what have we learned? Well, well, how rest works. So we've sort of, uh, we don't have obviously uh, pinpoint to, we have a much better idea thanks to some of the uh, artifacts that were recovered out there. We've already mentioned the retreat fields, which were subject to study. They clearly showed, you know, where the crown forces were going and where presumably they ended up. And then of course, uh, studying the Tory Fort, um, we're fairly confident now that we can model with some precision the location of the Tory Fort based on the pattern of fired and dropped balls, um, musket balls. So forward of the fort, we've got quite a few fired and maybe some blooded um, projectiles. Behind the fort, it's all dropped balls, <laughs> which is indicative of you know, uh, someone running away in a hurry. In this case, most likely the uh, Tories as they fled. And this final slide here, we've got um, some of the, a mix of artifacts and trophies. Um, so in the upper uh, left-hand corner there, we've got some case shot, which was fired by a cannon. Not only on Hessian Hill, but also um, apparently at the Tory Fort, which we did not expect to find. And then we've got, you know, some other trophies that were recovered um, at the time of the battle, after the battle. Uh, you can see uh, one of the trophy cannon actually now uh, on display. I believe uh, on the, an appropriate reproduction carriage. Um, at the uh, Bennington Museum. So, yeah, we've got, there's no shortage of ways to approach this battle, is I guess um, sort of the, the takeaway I'd, I'd offer you uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, you can study the historical accounts, you can study the archaeology, you can apply modern. Uh, what's called cocoa techniques to sort of uh, as an analytical tool that was you know not commonly used you know prior to the modern era. So there's any number of ways to attack this thing, and you know I would say that you know, if you are interested in the Battle of Bennington 
or if you have been for a number of years, um, if you've never actually walked the ground where it was fought, um, I highly recommend doing so either on your own or as part of a uh, tour that we offer occasionally. It really, uh, it makes, not only does it make it all come alive, I would argue it makes, it makes it, you know, comprehensible at all, really to see where this battle was fought, um, to place some of these accounts, even approximately, uh, will advance your understanding of the battle considerably. So that's my plug, um, to visit the battlefield. And I suppose right now, what we could do is um, go ahead and exit my screen and maybe take some questions. Great, thank you so much, David. That was really fascinating. And, um, you know, I've been learning about the Battle of Bennington for, you know, in, in dribs and drabs for about 15 years now. And uh, I learned something new today. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna invite our, our audience to start um, entering questions into the chat. So the chat feature is available at the bottom of your screen. If you would just type your questions in, um, to that space, I will share them with David. And while I'm giving you a second to do that, I'm going to share my screen and just really encourage you um, to, especially during this time where, where folks aren't traveling quite as much, um, take advantage of the amazing local historical sites that we have and please visit um, the Battle of Benning, or the Battlefield, um, the museum, and the Bennington Battle Monument. And um, I'll also just say that, you know, all of your cultural resources, your historical resources really need your support right now more than ever. We always need your support, but um, right now is a really critical time for all of us. So if you are interested in, in that history, please um, follow, use any or all of the links that you see on your screen and um, show your support to those organizations. So let me just open up the chat here. And um, we do have one question so far. Um, so the, the question that's been raised is, how many Vermonters died in the battle, David? Mute, unmute you here. Hold on a sec, David. You're muted. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Unfortunately, as I as I sort of hinted at when we were considering um, some of the battles after math, that's an answer. That's a question with no specific answer. Aware of, um, presumably some, but real. Um, we have Stark's letter. We've got another letter. I think by that point, probably by Gates. Uh, um, that outlines some categories in a Cash monitors, it's a very, and you know, I'm interested in what they're <laughs> So, um, unfortunately, we, I think, missed a good chunk of your, your response there. Oops. Um, due to the, the technical difficulties. <laughs> but, um, you know, I have to say that the, uh, the, the lag has created these really great moments of suspense during the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so a little more specifically, um, the same um, participant says that um, uh, is asking about John Fay. So the son of Stephen Fay, who owned um, the Catamount Tavern, um, 
is believed to have died during the Battle of Bennington. And I wonder if you are, if you know that story at all. Yes, I believe I do. Um, and actually, I might be able to, depending on how cooperative the technology is going to be, I might actually be able to pull up the relevant account there. <laughs> well, it's not, I can't bring it to hand um, quickly, but as I understand it, um, the story goes something uh, like this. He's, uh, he's informed that his son uh, died in the battle, and rather than, um, you know, reacting with horror or uh, shock or you know, uh, deep sadness. Supposedly his reaction was to essentially, you know, accept the fact with some resignation and, and take pride in it that, you know, he had his son had the ultimate price and made this uh, the most uh, way to the battle. So uh, it, as I understand it, that's the story anyway. I'm sorry, I couldn't look up the uh, specific account quickly. Yeah, that's my understanding of, of the story as well, that, um, you know, he, that Stephen kind of said, well, you know, I'm glad that he died fighting for this cause and fighting for the country. And yeah, rather than reacting in an emotional sort of way. For those that don't know, um, Stephen Fay was the owner of a tavern that the Green Mountain Boys, um, who were so instrumental in the second portion of the battle, used as their headquarters. And um, if you're in Bennington on your way to the battle monument, you'll see the statue of the, uh, the catamount or mountain lion, as those from outside of Vermont call it, that marks the site of, of that tavern. Any other questions for David before we wrap up here? Okay, our, our participant um, notes that, I'm not sure if she's referring, to, I think she's referring to Stephen Fay uh, was her fifth great uncle. So lots oh. of local connections. Um, just before we, we wrap up, I did promise that I would be um, launching some, uh, a project that uh, as part of the, the sort of citizen-led um, Battle Day Commemoration Committee, uh, David and Mary Lou Chicote from the Monument and I with some additional help um, from some uh, vo other volunteers have been working on. And um, especially during this time where, where travel can be limited and perhaps you're exploring some of your local resources or if you're from outside of the area um, and want to know how to find all of these things, we've created a sort of virtual driving tour. It's accessible um, through your, your computer, but it's also accessible through your, your cell phone, through your mobile device. Um, and I am excited to reveal that to you here today. Let me switch what I'm sharing. The platform that we're using is called Vermont, and um, this is our Battle of Bennington driving tour. And you see right now it's got three stops on it. It's got the battlefield, the Bennington Museum, and the Bennington Battle Monument. Um, you can take them in any order. I recommend going to the battlefield first, um, and then perhaps the monument, and then the museum. Um, just it sort of makes sense in that order. Um, but each of these sections will give you a little bit more information about sites, including what all of our um, open hours are. We are all open for, for business these days um, to varying degrees and, and at different hours and whatnot. Um, so please do check that and check our websites before you, you venture out. Um, 
And this will give you a little bit of information about each of the sites and a little sneak preview, as well as giving you a handy map to fight all of, uh, to find all of them. Oh, I've got fighting on my mind, I guess, <laughs> after all that battle talk. So um, as I mentioned, I will send that link to everyone who joined us today after our, our talk this afternoon. And I hope that everyone will make good use of it. Um, as time allows, we are going to keep adding um, sites because of course there are a lot of sites along the way, um, historic markers along the way, spots that you need to check out if you're um, really interested in uh, getting your, your hands into the history of this battle. So David, thank you so much for um, joining us today once again and uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. It was great to see your face, and thank you so much to all of the, the folks who joined us today. David, I hope you have a, a good battle day weekend. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Have a, a great afternoon.